Hi guys, uh, this is the video for the notes for section 7.2. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, there we go. Okay, so as you can see here, and I'm gonna just do a little rearranging on my screen here because I wanna make sure that I can see you guys clearly without distraction. So let's go ahead and get rid of all that. All right, there we go. So thank you for your patience. So in section 7.2, we're gonna be talking about operations with decimals. We are also going to discuss repeating decimals and sequential, sequentially repeating decimals, and we're going to discuss scientific notation. So let's get going. Now, um, for operations with decimals, you have some basic algorithms on how to work with them. You have probably already done this a million times and you just don't realize it, okay? So let's go ahead and begin with some things that you should remember. You should remember uh, from previous discussions as well as probably from a previous lifetime in math, that for the addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of decimals, it's really just a simple extension of the way you did addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division of whole numbers. It really doesn't change a whole lot. Minor adjustments have to be made. So for example, Okay, when we do the addition of decimals, there are two ways to approach it. You can, with anything with decimals, you can always approach it from two sides. You can either approach it from the fractional approach or from the decimal approach, because decimals really is just another way of writing parts of wholes, so they are intimately related to fractions. So if we were given, for example, this problem here of 3.56 plus 7.95, the fractional approach dictates that what we're going to do is we're going to convert each of these decimals into their fractional component. This is a good time to, on the aside, remind you how it is that we do that. We take a decimal such as 3.56, and the way you turn that into a fraction is you take your decimal point where it is, and you move it all the way over to the right, in essence, creating a whole number. Now, instead of 3.56, I'm looking at 356. So I write that down as a numerator to my fraction. Now, to come up with my denominator, because we're talking decimals, we're always talking powers of 10. So the way you come up with your denominator is you add one, and then the number of places that you moved your decimal to the right, determines how many zeros your power of 10 has to have. Okay, let's not do that, Compu uh, laptop, please don't do that. It just shut down on me, my apologies for that. Let's see if we can uh, get it back up and running. All right, well, let's get back to where we were. Here we go, okay, so right there, because, um, we move the decimal over two places to the right. That tells us that we're gonna put one at the bottom of our denominator and add two zeros for the two places we moved. And so 3.56 becomes 356 hundredths, which makes sense because if we were to cover up the whole number three, we would read this decimal as 56 hundredths right? And because we have the whole number three, we realize that we have more than 56 hundredths. We have three holes plus the 56 hundredths, so we have 356 hundredths, right? So that is how we do the conversion from decimal to fraction. That was just a quick little aside. So now if we go back here to the problem we were looking at, they've gone ahead and done just that. They've taken 356 and converted it to its fractional form. They've done the same thing to 7.95, converted it to its fractional form. And now we can follow the rules of addition of fractions like we've discussed in our previous unit where we add numerators. So 356 plus 795 becomes 1151 and we carry denominators into our answer. So it's still over a hundred. Now, how do we convert this fraction back into a decimal? Two ways. By hand, all you have to do is think, okay, I have a numerator that is 1151. 
which if I read it as a whole number, means the decimal point is right here. Because I have a denominator with two zeros, that means I'm gonna move my decimal point in two places to the left. So the fraction 1151 over 100 becomes the decimal point, the decimal 11.51. So that's the by hand method. The other method, of course, is you read this as a division problem from top to bottom and put it into your calculator that way. Put it into your calculator as 1151 divided by 100 and your calculator will very much obligingly give you this decimal back. You could also get that same decimal back if you do the division by hand. So you, in essence, have a couple of different ways in which you can get from a fraction to a decimal, okay? You can either do it by knowing how to count the zeros and move in that decimal place to the left um, of your numerator to get the decimal version of that fraction. You can do it by thinking of the, dec the fraction as a division problem and typing it in that way into your calculator from top to bottom, 1151 divided by 100, and your calculator will obligingly give you the decimal. Or you can do it by hand and do the division, which you're going to see in a minute um, is very helpful when we're looking at repeating decimals and sequentially repeating decimals. So that is the fractional approach to adding decimals. But you're going to find that although being able to do this is important, um, most people do not choose to add decimals by turning them into fractions first. They prefer to use the second method, which is the decimal approach, okay? And the rules for the decimal approach are simple. You must line up the decimal points to align the place values. And then all you have to do is add as usual and make sure that your decimal point is in your answer. As you can see here in this example, we took the same example again. We took 3.56 and we're adding to it 7.95. And we are adding as usual, starting from the ones, right? So we have our line here and we're gonna go six and five is 11 carry the one, that makes that one and five is six, six and nine is 15, carry the one, one and three is four, four and seven is 11. And then because my decimal point is aligned, I drop it in the exact same place into my answer and there's my answer, 1151, okay? This obviously is the more efficient way of adding decimals and hence the one that is most commonly used as the approach, but you should be aware of how to use the fractional approach as well. All right, moving on to subtraction, we basically have the same two approaches again, okay? Once again, with subtraction, we do the same two approaches, same as an addition. We have the fractional and we have the decimal. So let's look at the fractional. Once again, you would take your problem and you would take each decimal and convert to the fraction form by moving your decimal point all the way to the end to get your numerator, and then using that to in, uh, let you know how many zeros to put into your denominator by writing one, and I moved three places, so my denominator gets the three zeros, as we just discussed. And then they did that here as well, but you'll notice and here's an important thing, you don't always have common denominators. So in this case, I have a denominator of a thousand for my first decimal. I have a denominator of a hundred for my second. So as rules of fractions require, I would have to go ahead and find a common denominator for that. And when I check my co uh, least common denominator or the least common multiple, which is how you would go about finding a common denominator between 1,000 and 100, turns out to be 1,000. So now I have to restate my fractions in terms of 1,000. So my first fraction stays the same. My second fraction goes from 895 hundredths to 8,950 thousandths. Now I can go ahead and perform my subtraction from left to right and I get five, uh, I get 14,793 minus 8,950 gives me 5,400.
843 over 1,000. And then as we discussed before, you convert this fraction into its decimal form and it becomes 5.813. Now that looks like a really lengthy process, although you should be able to do it. Whereas we can just use the decimal version wherein once again, we follow the rules of lining up our decimal points completing the subtraction as we're accustomed to, dropping our decimal point into its place, and look at that, we get the exact same answer. So of course, once again, I would recommend to use the decimal version of subtraction of decimals versus the fractional, but be aware that you should be able to do it in both methods, okay? Now, multiplication, as we've been doing so far, has both approaches again. You can once again, from multiplication, choose to convert each of your decimals into their fractional components. Okay, and then the rules of multiplication say that you multiply numerators together to get your new numerator, and we multiply denominators together to get our new denominator and then following the rules that I've already shown you how you take this new fraction and convert it into decimal form, you can do just that and you get your answer in decimal form, which is uh, 1,660 and 942 thousandths, okay? However, as with addition and subtraction, multiplication of decimals might prove to be easier if you've actually just do the decimal multiplication, all right? Now, for decimal multiplication, you do not need to line up the decimal points, okay? This is important because it's the biggest difference thus far. With decimal addition, we had to line up the decimal points. With decimal subtraction, we had to line up the decimal points. With decimal multiplication, we do not need to line them up, okay? All you have to do is write the problem out like you see here in this example, okay? And multiply as usual. So you would go eight times nine is 72, carry the seven, eight times zero is zero, plus seven is seven, eight times seven is 56, carry the five, eight times three is 24, plus five is 29, carry the two, eight times four is 32 plus two is 34. So you're multiplying just like you normally do. We are for the time being ignoring the decimal point, okay? Then we go ahead and put our placeholder and we begin with the three. Three times nine is 27, carry the two. Three times zero is zero plus two. So we have a two, okay? Three times seven is 21, carry the two. Three times three is nine, plus two is 11, carry the one. Three times four is 12, and one is 13, okay? And then as we normally do with multiplication, we are now ready to add. You would go ahead and add all your numbers, and you get one, six, six, zero, nine, four, two. Now, once we get to the answer, we now are ready to do this step right here, which is to count the number of digits that were to the right of the decimal in the problem. In the problem, okay? So count the number of digits that were to the right of the decimal. So we come back up here and we notice that in our first number, there were two digits to the right of decimal. In our second number, there was one digit to the right of decimal, making a total of three digits that were to the right of the decimal in the problem. Since there were three digits to the right of the decimal in the problem, we now go to our answer. We start here on the right where all decimal points live in whole numbers, and we're going to move it in three places to account for those three digits that we had giving us the answer as we expected it from the previous example of 1660.942. And I'm writing it down here just so it's a little clearer for you to see. Okay, so that is how we do decimal multiplication. I will honestly tell you that I don't 
see the fractional approach to decimal multiplication and the decimal approach to decimal multiplication as being one more efficient than the other. Um, definitely the decimal form is how I was taught back in the day. It was the most common way of teaching multiplication of decimals, but it's good for your toolbox to be able to do it both ways because as you're teaching decimal multiplication to your elementary school students, you don't know which of these two methods will be the easiest for your student to understand and to have the concept click. So it would be important for you to be well versed in both forms. Okay, moving on to the division of decimals, we have the same situation. Once again, we can approach it either fractionally or decimally. I will say that just like in multiplication, I don't find that, that either method is more or less efficient in performing the task. It's really a matter of which concept seems to just click and make more sense to you as a student and then thereby for your students when you're teaching it. Um, so unlike the um, addition and subtraction where I do believe the decimal approach is absolutely more efficient than the fractional approach to perform the addition calculation or the subtraction calculation in multiplication and division, I really don't find that one is, is better than the other. It's just whichever one works for you. Okay, so when doing division of um, decimals, here we have the problem of 154.63 divided by 4.7. We can definitely do the fractional approach where we turn 154.63 into its corresponding fraction, which is 15,463 hundredths being divided by, we take our 4.7 and turn it into its corresponding fraction, which is 47 tenths. And then we follow the rules for division of fractions, which is your keep, change, flip. So we're going to keep our first fraction, change to multiplication, flip our second fraction. And then we go ahead and follow the rules of multiplication, which means multiply numerators to get our new numerator, multiply denominate, I'm sorry, denominators to get our new denominator. And now that we have this new fraction to turn it back into decimal um, notation, since in the end we were doing a problem of decimal division, you just read it from top to bottom as a division problem, like I mentioned before, particularly when you're starting to get these fractions with really large numbers, I find that this is just the simplest. Read it from top to bottom as a division problem, put it into your calculator and go 15, uh, 154,630 divided by 4,700 and your calculator will tell you, oh, that's 32.9 and now you're back into decimal notation. Again, you could do this longhand, but of the three methods that I showed you at the beginning of this lecture as to how you can turn a fraction into a decimal, you cannot do the count back method here because your de uh, denominator is not base 10. That count back method where you just count how many zeros to show you how to move your decimal back to the left only applies if your denominator in fractional form is base 10. In this case, it is not, it's 4,700. So um, you would have to just do the division either by putting it into your calculator or by doing it longhand, okay? Now, decimal division, and I'm gonna go ahead and do it side by side to this example so that I can walk you through the steps, is not complicated, but it does have some quirks to it, okay? So decimal division, this is where we're saying, okay, we have 154.63 divided by 4.7. Well, in order to do this division, we must, in essence, take the thing we're dividing by, the divisor, and turn it into a whole number. So the way we turn it into a whole number is we go ahead and take that decimal and we move it to the right. Okay? But however many places we had to move it to the right in order to turn it into a whole number, because now instead of being 4.7, it is the whole number 47, we have to adjust by moving the decimal point of the thing that's being divided the dividend and we have to move it as well. So since I had to move one place to the right to turn 4.7 into 47, I must take the decimal of my dividend and move it over one place to the right to turn it into 
0.3. Now, once I've done that, not only do I write the adjustment here, but I also put the adjustment up on my line so that now I know where the decimal point is going to be in my answer, the quotient. And now I can begin to start dividing the way I normally would. So I'm going to go ahead and say, all right, well, 47 can go into about 154 three times, right? 3 times 7 is 21, carry the 2. 3 times 4 is 12, and 2 is 14, okay? And I do my subtraction, and 4 minus 1 is 3, and 5 minus 4 is 1. 47 obviously can't go into 13, but I have a nice friendly number I can bring on down, so my 13 becomes 136. And I'll go, okay, how many times can 47 go into 136? About two times, okay? Two times seven is 14, carry the one. Two times eight, four is eight, and one is nine. So I do my subtraction there. Six minus four is two, and 13 minus nine is four. 47 can't go into 42, but again, I still have a nice friendly number to bring down. So this becomes 423. Now note that because I am now bringing down the three, I am on the right of the decimal, but it doesn't matter. My decimal is already in my problem, so I don't have to worry about adjusting as to where the decimal is going to be in my answer. So unlike with multiplication, where you kind of deal with where the decimal point goes in your answer at the very end of the calculation, with division, the adjustments we make before we even start dividing automatically handle the placement of our decimal point into our answer, okay? so. 47 goes into 423 about nine times. Sorry, my pen shut off here. About nine times. So nine times seven is 63, carry the six. Nine times four is 36 plus the six, which gives us the 42. And look at that, we are done. We have a zero remainder which when dividing decimals is required. As you will note later when we talk about repeating decimals and sequentially repeating decimals, when we're doing division of decimals this way longhanded, we are required to have a zero remainder. If you do not have a zero remainder, you are in essence now walking into a repeating decimal or a repeating sequential decimal. Okay, so that is how you divide decimals using division, decimal division instead of using fractional division. Um, as I said, I don't think one method is any more or less efficient than the other. Work with the method that makes the most sense to you, but be sure that you are well versed in both since you'd have to be able to teach both um, as well as be able to perform both for this unit. All right, let's move on into scientific notation. Okay, scientific notation in essence, as you see here by the definition, is shorthand for expressing very large or extremely small numbers. Please note that both in both cases, you were talking about very long and cumbersome decimals, very large numbers and very small numbers. In essence, you're talking about very big cumbersome decimals, which is why, excuse me, um, scientific notation was invented. And in essence, it was invented as in its name by scientists excuse me because as a general rule scientists are working with those kinds of numbers and doing calculations with them so it's important that they be able to do so in an efficient manner and that's why scientific notation was created now there are some rules the rules first state that you must have your number, whatever decimal it is, whether extremely large or small, written in this format, okay? Where you have a times 10 to, to the power of n, okay? A, in essence, is the decimal that you're going to work with, and it has some rules that it must follow. A must, you see here, be greater than or equal to one, so it can be one, but it must be less than 10, so it cannot be 10. So in essence, A must always be any number that falls, decimal number, that falls between one and nine, okay? Those are the rules. A must be a decimal number that falls between one and nine. 
Okay, and the other thing you need to know is that n, which is going to be the power of 10, is determined by the number of places that the decimal point had to be moved when you were creating your a. Let me walk you through a problem so that it makes sense. Remember that this is the format we're going for, okay? So if we start with this number here, here is our very large decimal. Okay, because remember that any whole number in essence is a decimal. It has a decimal point all the way at the right. We don't bother to write it because there's no non-zero number past it, and therefore it makes no sense to put it there, but it is there. So the, here is a very large decimal. In order to write it in scientific notation, I must first, step one, create my A, okay? As you saw in my rules, the A is created by moving the decimal point so that I get an A, that follows the rule of being between one and nine. So where is my decimal point? As I just mentioned, my decimal point is all the way here to the right of this very large number. And so that's where it is. And now I'm gonna start moving it until I get a number that follows the rules for A, meaning it has to be between one and nine. So I move it, I move it, I move it, and it's still, everything that would te technically be to the left of the decimal is still larger than one to nine. So I have to keep moving it. Move it, move it, move it. Nope, still larger, keep going. Move it, move it, move it, still larger. I now have 54 to the left of the decimal. So one more time and there we go. I now have 5.45. So because I have that, and I have 5.45, that is now my A, which is called the mantissa. Please note that any non, any zeros to the right of the decimal point get dropped off. We only hold on to the non-zero numbers. So all these zeros get dropped off and that is why you only have 5.45 as your A, okay? Now, when I did my moving, I counted and I have moved it 10 places. This is important because now I know that my n, or the power of 10, is going to be equal to 10. So now that I've created my a and I know what my n is, I'm ready to write it in scientific notation using the format. My a is 5.45 times 10, and my n is 10, so times 10 to the n, and there it is. That is how you write this number in scientific notation, okay? Now, in a little bit, we're gonna deal with how we go from a really small number and turn it into scientific notation, but let's talk about how we do operations with numbers that are written in scientific notation. You might be tempted to take numbers that are written in scientific notation and turn them back into their original version, but that would just make your life harder and you'd be working much more, uh, more time and more effort to complete your calculation. So it's better to just learn how we do this. And the way it is, basic rule of thumb, whenever you're doing an operation with numbers that are written in scientific notation, is that we work with the A's first, and then we work with the powers of 10 and whatever calculation we're doing. So here we're gonna do multiplication. As you can see, we're working with multiplication. Okay. And we're being given the following numbers. We're being given 5.45, and I'm just gonna rewrite it here since it's a little hard to see in the notes. 5.45 times 10 to the power of 10. That is my first number. And yes, we put it in parentheses so as not to get it confused with this times. And the other number we're gonna work with is 3.46 times 10 to the power of eight, okay? So as you see here, we work with the A's first. So my A is 5.45 and 3.46. So that is what I'm gonna multiply A times A's. And then my powers of 10 are gonna be 10 to the power of 10 and 10 to the power of eight. Those are gonna be what I'm gonna multiply here, okay? My powers of 10. So we multiply A's with A's and, 10, and powers of 10 with powers of 10. So, when I multiply 5.45 times 3.46, I get 
point eight eight uh sorry that's five let's get rid of that eighteen point uh, eight five seven okay that is my what i the answer that I got when I multiplied my a's the problem is eighteen point eight five seven does not follow the rules of what an a should be remember that the rules for the a is that it must be a value between one and nine so i have to adjust that okay and i adjust that by following the rules of making the a which is move your decimal so I, if i move my decimal one place over to the left now i get one point eight eight five seven so it's following the rules but i moved it over one place so that means it's times 10 to the one so now the a i created when i multiplied is its own little scientific number right now i'm going to multiply my powers of 10. the power rule for exponents as you see here highlighted for you the power rule for exponents is that if you have exponents with the same base you add their powers that's what the power rule says add their powers so obviously i'm working with powers of 10 i'm always going to have the same base so if i got 10 to the 10th power and 10 to the 8th power i add their powers so i'm going to end up with 10 to the 18th power and so here it is here is my um new power of 10 but i have to now account for the fact that because i had to adjust my original a because when i multiplied my a's i ended up with a decimal that did not follow the rules for a's and i had to adjust it using the rules for a's so i ended up with this little mini scientific number i now have to account for this additional power of 10 that has popped out so i keep the adjusted a that i made but i now have to adjust my powers of 10 i now have 10 to the one power and a 10 to the 18th power and according to my power rule i have to add those powers together so really i have 10 to the 19th so my answer becomes 1.8857 times 10 to the 19th power and that is the answer to our original problem of 5.45 times 10 to the 10. And I'm going to make myself some room here. Times 3.46 times 10 to the 8th is equal to 1.8857 times 10 to the 19th. Now, you could get to the same answer if you took this number converted it back to its originally large number and took this number and converted it back to its originally large number multiplied them together and then took your answer and converted it to scientific notation you could get there as well but as you can you will find that doing it this way just remembering the rules of we multiply our a's first and then we multiply our powers of 10 and when we multiply our a's if the answer we get does not follow the rules for a's then we must convert it into the rules for a okay so <clears throat> that's an example of multiplication let's do a division one okay and although i have it all broken down for you here i think i want to be able to do it all over again for you so that you can follow it through more um, carefully so I'm going to rewrite the whole problem over here on this blank um, so that we can work through it together. Okay. Um, we have 1.2 times 10 to the 12th divided by 6.25 times 10 to the 7th. So 1.2 times 10 to the 12th divided by 6.25, 6.25, 0.25 times 10 to the seventh. Let me make sure that that's the case. Yes, it is. All right. So again, the rule is we're going to work with our A's first, and then we're going to work with our powers of 10, right? So first, we're going to divide our A's. That means that we're going to have 
2 divided by 6.25, right? Times, we're keeping that times because remember this is being multiplied, this is being multiplied, times, and now we're going to do our powers of 10. 10 to the 12th divided by 10 to the 7th. So here's our A's being divided, and here's our powers of 10 being divided. Now, if you'll note here in this aside on the notes, I showed you that just like we had a power rule for multiplication of exponents that have the same base, right? We add their powers. We also have an exponent rule that states that if you're dividing exponents with the same base, we subtract their powers, okay? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to move over here and we're going to work. So first we do our division and we do 1.2 divided by 6.25. You put that into your calculator and it turns out, if you can see it right here, that it is 0.1. One nine two. Well, this is a problem because this is our new A and it does not follow the rules for A. We have zero in front of the decimal and we're told that for the A's, it has to be between one and nine. This is less than one. It is breaking the rule. So we're going to adjust by moving the decimal point. Now you'll notice that before, when we had big numbers that we were writing in scientific notation, we moved our decimal point to the left to create our A so that we would have an A that fell between one and nine. Well, this is what we would call a small number that we're turning into scientific notation. And I cannot move it to the left because technically there's only zeros there. I'm gonna have to move it to the right. So I will move my decimal point over to the right. And now I have 1.92, which does follow the rules of my A's, but I have to account for the fact that I moved that decimal. So that's 10 times 10. And remember the N is the number of times I move the decimal. Well, when I move it to the left, that is a positive number that is N. When I move it to the right, it is a negative number that is n. So I moved it to the right one time. So that becomes negative one, 10 to the negative one. You can see that here in the notes. I did write that down for you, okay? And it tells you here, it says, in scientific notation, n, right, which is the power of 10, will be positive when you move the decimal point to the left to create your A, but it will be negative when you move your decimal point to the right to create your A, okay? So in this case, we had to move it to the right to create our A, so that's why our power is negative, okay? But this is still our A that we got when we divided our original A's, okay? Now we have to go times and we divide our powers of 10. Now, according to this rule that I showed you right here, okay, our powers of 10, if we're dividing them and they have the same base, we subtract their powers. Well, if we do 12 minus seven, that gives me 10 to the fifth power. This is my new base 10, which I now need to bring down here, right, with my, new A. So that means that if I bring it down, this becomes times 10 to the fifth. But now I have two powers of 10, so I need to adjust these powers of 10 into my new power of 10. So this becomes 1.92, which is my A, times 10. And again, what was the rule if we were multiplying the same exponents with the same base? We add their powers. So that means negative one plus five is a positive four. So this is my new power of 10. And this is the whole new answer. So in essence, what I'm saying is, okay, and I'm gonna make this a little, if I can see if I can make it a little smaller, there we go. I'm saying that, 1.2 times 10 to the 12th power divided by 6.25 times 10 to the seventh power is equal to 1.92 times 10 to the fourth power. OK, 
okay? Because I followed these steps. Now, hopefully you were able to follow through with what I was doing here as we did it together in the video. And then you can review and revisit these steps right here in the notes, um, which will also obviously be available to you. You can see how we got through all the steps down to the original answer. And then you have your aside here reminding you what it is, how we determine positive or negative powers of scientific notation. And it's um, important that you remember that and it's based on which direction you had to move the decimal to create the A that follows the rules for the A of being between one and nine when writing numbers in scientific notation, okay? Last but not least, for this uh, section, we want to talk about repeating decimals. Now, terminating decimals are decimals that do not repeat, in essence, okay? And you will know that you're looking at a terminating decimal if, and that's the important part here, if the fraction that created those decimals, okay, if the denominators of those fractions if you were to get the prime factorization of them, you would find that they would only have two and five in their prime factorization. When that is the case, then you can be sure that you're looking at a, at a fraction that will turn into a decimal that terminates, meaning it does not repeat, okay? So for example, if you look here at this fraction of 7 40th, I see that my denominator of 40 ends in zero. So I know that it's going to have prime factors of two and five. Since I know it's going to have prime factors of two and five, in fact, you can see here because I did the prime factorization for it, it only has twos and fives in it, which is usually the case with any number that is even or ends in zero, right? Because of that, I know that I'm going to be able to turn this fraction, 7 40ths, into a decimal that will terminate. And sure enough, if I do it longhand, instead of just putting into my calculator as a division problem of 7 divided by 40, but I actually do it longhand, 7 divided by 40, 40 can't go into 7, which is what forces me to put in the decimal point and therefore turn it into a decimal. But 40 can go into 70, it goes in one time. So I take one times 40 is 40 and I subtract. And when that happens, I end up getting my decimal of 0 0.175. You can follow the longhand division all through here. I know most of you would probably put it into your calculator, but it is important that you be able to do it longhand division. One, because I believe on the test you're required to do it without your calculator. Two, because when you're teaching this concept to your elementary school students, you're going to require them to be able to do it longhand before you're going to allow them to use a calculator. So you should be able to do it as well. You get that 7 40th becomes 0 0.175. Why do we know it terminates? Remainder of zero, okay? That's how we know it terminates. And you could have predicted that when you saw that the denominator of the fraction you were converting into a decimal is going to have a prime factorization that only includes twos and fives. This is usually um, expected if you're looking at a denominator that is even, ends in zero, or ends in five. Okay? You can make those predictions. Now, what happens when that, that's not the case? Well, that's when we no longer have terminating decimals. That's when we have repeating decimals. Okay? So here's what happens. Here's the fraction I'm looking at, one third. And I want to turn that into a decimal. Well, right away, I look at that denominator. Three is already prime and clearly will not contain twos and five, fives in its prime factorization, which means I'm looking at a repeating decimal. And if I do it longhand and I go three, one, read it from top to bottom, one divided by three, one divided by three, I'm forced to put in my decimal and add a zero because clearly three can't go into one, but it can go into 10. And I begin my longhand process. But here's what you should notice, which alerts you to the fact that you're looking at a repeating decimal. Every time I go 10 minus nine, I get a one. Now in decimal division, I'm allowed to add as many zeros as I want to the right of the decimal point because it does not change the value of the number that I'm working with. But if that happens, every time that I get 10 minus nine is one and I bring down a zero, I'm back to 10, which means that I'm back to doing 10 minus nine. So every time you see that one show up, which is going to keep showing up, meaning you're never going to have a remainder of zero, you're always gonna have a remainder of one for which you then bring down a zero 
and then the process repeats. This tells you I am repeating this for, this is a repeating decimal. Now, if you look at this aside here, this is how we deal with repeating decimals. We put a line over the thing that repeats, which we call the period, okay? That tells you this is the piece of the decimal that is going to keep repeating. That is the period, okay? In this case, it is made up of only the digit three, but in sequentially repeating decimals, it could have a sequence of numbers that will then continue to repeat. So that's why that's the period. The part that repeats itself, in this case, it's the three that is repeating, we call that the repeat end, okay? Which really, as you can see, it's not very creative. They took in repeat and end and put it together. It's the part that repeats, okay? Now, if we look at another example here, you'll see the same thing again. This time, the denominator is seven, also prime. This does not mean you will always have prime denominators, but if it is a prime denominator, you know that it's not fitting um, the rule that we looked at before, that if it was even or ends in zero or five, it's going to have a prime factorization containing twos and fives. So it will be a terminating decimal, meaning it will have a zero remainder and the decimal will not keep repeating. In this case, it's not possible. We have seven as our denominator. Seven is a prime number. Therefore, it has no hope of having twos and fives in its prime factorization, meaning we're looking at a repeating decimal. So once again, if we read it as a division problem from six divided by seven from top to bottom, here it is, six divided by seven. I got to put in my decimal because seven doesn't go into six, but it will go into 60, okay? But here's the problem. I, here's that six, and bear in mind that this six with the added zero is where we started, okay? This will come into play in a minute. So seven goes into 60 eight times. Eight times seven is 56. We subtract, we get a four. And you might think, oh, maybe this is not going to repeat bring down a zero, seven goes into 45 times, five times seven is 35. We subtract, we get a five. You're like, who knows? Maybe this is gonna end, add another zero, okay? Seven goes into 57 times, seven times seven is 49. We subtract, we get a one, bring down another zero. Seven goes into 10 one time, one times seven is seven, 10 minus seven is three, bring down another zero and so on and so forth. And you're thinking, this is going to eventually end, right? And you'll notice that the numbers are not the same numbers repeating like they were with one third. We've got eight, five, seven, one, four, two. How do you know it's going to repeat? Here's what happens. When we get all the way down here and we get to 20 minus 14 is six. Uh-oh. Isn't that where we started? Six bring down a zero, right? Six add a zero. We're about to start all over again. When this happens, you know that you're about to start a repeat sequence again. And this is what we call a sequentially repeating decimal. And when you were to write it using the notation we talked about above, you're going to put your bar over the entire period because in this decimal, it's going to repeat in this order. It's going to go 857142. 857142, 857142, on and on into infinity. This whole period is the part that repeats. Okay, and the repeatants are 857142. So, because you will never get a remainder of zero, eventually you always get back to this six and then start the process all over again. We know it's a sequentially repeating decimal. Please note that in what in decimals that we call terminating decimals, we think of as the remainder of zero as being the repeatant that continues to repeat, which is why it's a terminating decimal, okay? Now, how do you write the fraction that represents a repeating decimal? Because we just showed you how you can go from fractions to decimals. And in our previous examples, when we were talking about addition, um, subtraction, multiplication, and division of decimals, we were able to move seamlessly between fraction notation for that decimal and decimal notation for that fraction. But what do you do with when you have a repeating decimal? How do you write that in fractional notation? Well, there is a method to the madness, okay? Here are the rules. If you have a repeating decimal that has no whole number in front of the decimal, in other words, no number to the left of the decimal, just numbers to the right of the decimal. Okay, 
If you have a repeating decimal that has no whole number in front of the decimal, then the rules are you're going to write the decimal as a fraction over a denominator with a power of 10, just like I showed you earlier on in this lecture. You will then subtract one from that denominator and you will write the resulting fraction. Here is an example that will make it a little easier. So let's say that we have, and I'm going to, I have that example in your notes, but I want to walk you through it here in this blank space. And then we're going to look at it in the notes. Okay. Let's say that you have the decimal 0 0.34, which happens to be a repeating decimal. It goes 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4, 3, 4. Okay. In order to write the corresponding fraction that would give you back this repeating decimal every single time, the rules say to write it, right? Step one, write the decimal as a fraction. Well, the rule we, we talked about at the beginning of this lecture was move the decimal point to the right to create a whole number, that's 34, right? So now I've got 34 over, and I write down one, and then I count how many places I moved for zeros. I moved two places, so zero, zero. There it is. However, this is not a repeating decimal. This is 34 hundredths. This is not 34 hundredths. This is 34 hundredths repeating, right? So to make the adjustments, I now follow step two, which says subtract one from the denominator. Okay. Well, that means that I'm going to have 34 and 100 minus 1. What is the resulting fraction? That's going to be 34 over 100 minus 1 is 99. This is the resulting fraction that corresponds to this decimal. And if you were to put this into your calculator and go 34 divided by 99 to get the decimal format of this fraction, you will get the 0.34 on repeat back, which is the idea, okay? So that is how we take this repeating decimal and write it as a fraction that accounts for the fact that it will repeat, okay? Now, you can see that example is right here, okay? You can follow it through. They took it, wrote it as a fraction, all right? Um, you can see that they wrote it as a fraction here. They took, they took the 0.34 on repeat and wrote it as a fraction. Then they followed the step of re subtract one so that you get 99 as your denominator. And if you put it into your calculator as a division problem, 34 divided by 99, your calculator gives you back the repeating decimal, okay? Now, what do you do if you have a number that has a whole number in front of the decimal, okay? We're still going to follow a lot of the same rules. You're still going to write a decimal with, as a fraction over a power of 10. You're still going to subtract, but now we have to add this extra step right here. This is the new step. This one we just did before. This one we just did before. This is the new step that we have to add to it. So I'm going to once again walk you through it first, and then I'm going to show you the example in the notes, okay? So we're going to move over here to some blank space. If we had 17.531, okay? First, step one. It says we have to take this and write it as a fraction by doing what we've done before, which is to move the decimal all the way over to create a whole number that will be our new numerator. So our new numerator is 17,531 over we use one and then we count how many places we move for zeros. One, two, three, so one, two, three, right? Now, step two says that because this had a whole number in the decimal form, I now have to take, subtract the whole number from the fraction numerator, okay? So that's what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, okay, so we're rewriting this as 17,531. It says subtract the whole number minus 17, and we're still over 1,000, right? That gives me 17,531 minus 17. If you put it into your calculator, it gives you 17,514. So it gives you 17,514 over 1,000. That was the additional step two, okay? Now, if we go on, 
step three, right, it said, what does it say to do? Subtract one from the denominator. So we're back to the steps we were using before. So now I'm going to say, okay, I take 17, 5, 14, and I'm going to subtract one from the denominator. So this is going to be 1,000 minus 1 which equals 17, 5, 14 over 999. And this, if I put it into my calculator, will go ahead and give me back the repeating decimal of 17.531 with the 531 on repeat, okay? So that is what you see here explained, okay? The steps, and then you can see them being followed here. Okay, and that's how you would turn a decimal that has a repeating portion to it, even though it has a whole number, that's how you would turn it into its appropriate fraction. And that's the fraction right here that you would get, okay, following these steps. All right, guys, that concludes the notes for section 7.2. I'm going to go ahead and stop my share. The homework's already been put up on the taskbar. So please complete the homework for section 7.2. I believe it's homework number 16, if I'm not mistaken, but it is uh, appropriately written on your assignment in the content page. It will be due on Friday by 1 p.m. And I will also make sure to have your video posted on time tomorrow. Please accept my deepest apologies. Um, there was a lot going on and I somehow just got waylaid and I apologize for that. It's unacceptable. And I will make sure that doesn't happen again. All right, guys, have a wonderful day.